every once in a while, if you watch long enough, you'll come across a show that changes your view on a bunch of different things. One of my favorite standbys is the belief that the ending of any show is paramount. A good ending can make a show, and a bad ending can break a show. So what do I do in a situation where we already know the ending, but we know nothing of the journey? I feel like this is what many Star Wars fans felt back when The Phantom Menace was first announced. Learning what the word prequel means. Because here's the thing, prequels don't really exist in anime. It's a big risk for a production company to take on, and it could very easily fail if the material is not good enough. But when we're talking about the Fate series, the story of obtaining that ultimate wish-granting device that is the Holy Grail, well, I guess in that case, anything is possible. Ladies, gentlemen, and others, my name is Arcata, and welcome to Glass Reflection today, Fate Zero. Let's jam! In a very basic sense, the setting and story of this show is very similar to the original Fate Stay Night. The Grail War takes place once again in the city of Fuyuki, and also has the main participants representing the three founding families, as well as the other interested parties looking to obtain the Grail. The main difference between this and the story of Fate Stay Night is that the vast majority of masters are not teenagers, and also that if you were interested in the Fate series at all before watching this, the ending should already be known to you. But the story of Fate Zero is what I would call an answer to all of my problems with the original Fate Stay Night. It's closer to a proper battle royale, or at least as close as we could possibly expect given a modern, unenclosed setting. There are pacts between members, betrayals, honor, death, deception, all things which are hallmarks of great stories. It's not just about the fight for the Grail either, though that indeed is a major factor, but it's more so on the reasons why each and every participant wishes to claim the Grail as their own. Although most of the reasons are on some level similar to each other, the battles between all of these characters become less of one about who is more skilled with their weapon, but who has more resolve about their ideals. Because of this, however, I almost feel like calling it a battle royale isn't really the best way to go, because it's not really an apt description of it. While the fantastical fights between all the servants are many and absolutely gorgeous in appearance, from a plot perspective they're a little more than spectacle, as the intrigue of the series is what truly decides everything. Seven masters, seven servants, each with their own defining personalities and a slew of supporting characters. You have to wonder how the show handles all of them. Well, in part it doesn't, though it does make a good go at it. The show starts with an extra double special length prologue episode that goes over the backstories and initial reasons behind all of the masters. Well, actually just most of them. Even with the extra time, the show still pushed Caster and his murderous sidekick of a master until later, which lets you know just how much backstory they attempted to push through in just a short amount of time. But as one may or may not expect, because of just how much there is, there are times when some characters get the shaft. Probably for the best though, because what we still got was quite remarkable. While the show does avoid labeling their characters as stereotypical good guys and bad guys, there are some rudimentary moral scales in place. Granted, those scales constantly spin and turn over onto their heads. Some characters like Waver and Kanith are in the war for recognition. Tokiomi and Katia are for what they believe to be family. Ryunosuke because it seemed like a good idea at the time, and finally both Kirei and Emiya to both find and achieve their ideals respectively. Emiya is the closest thing we have to a main character, and also turns out to be one of the more interesting ones. He acts on a very Vulcan, emotionless belief that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, and to a lesser extent, the ends justify the means. He would willingly kill 100 people if it meant saving the lives of 200, and acts in this war as one of the more ruthless players, taking the most effective and direct way to reach his goal. This, of course, conflicts directly with that of his servant, Saber. The same Saber that we also meet in Fate Stay Night, though seemingly a little more capable and sure of her own beliefs. Those beliefs contradict those of her master because she has an innate moral code that she lives by one that Emiya would and does consider a burden. What's interesting with all the master-servant pairs is that their individual personalities and goals 
almost seem to be polar opposites of each other. Or maybe it's more fitting to say that they mirror each other. Waver wants nothing more than to be recognized and acknowledged by his peers. And so he ends up summoning Ishkandar, King of Conquerors, who more or less just personifies that desire that he is unable to achieve. Tokiomi wants nothing more than the knowledge to reach what mages refer to as the Root, the source of all existence in the universe. So then he summons Gilgamesh, a being who believes himself to be God and that all of creation belongs to him, including that which Tokiomi seeks. Everything is laid out in such a way so that each master learns something from the servant that they summon, even if they themselves never live long enough to realize it. And that's the beauty with the intricacies of this show. The other beauty, of course, is, well, how it looks. <laughs> this should be quick, because really there's not much I can say about the animation designs of Fate Zero other than how amazing I think they are. It's the kind of show where more or less every single frame of animation is beautiful enough to print out and display on your wall. Now, I won't say that it's the best animation that I have ever borne witness to, mainly because I still believe theatrical films at least several of them have it beat. But it is most definitely the best looking series that I have watched to date, as it fills up all 25 episodes wonderfully, with little dip in quality. Oddly enough, the soundtrack is the point where I end up being a little disappointed. Prior to when Fate Zero originally aired in Japan, Yuki Kajura was one of my favorite composers. Like her work in Dot Hack, Madoka, the other type moon adaptation, Garden of Sinners, Brilliant stuff. But the more I listen to the soundtrack of Fate Zero, the more I realize I'm just not feeling it. To me, I feel like the music of a show should do more than just complement a series. It should add to a series with its own personality, as long as that personality does not conflict with the show itself. Here, though, I can't pin down anything truly remarkable. Sure, it's epic in scale, and it does keep up with the show in that regard, and so forth, but while it may surpass the musical quality of, say, Kenji Kawai's music from the original Fate Stay Night, I feel like it doesn't add the same sort of personality that that soundtrack did. And this is really interesting to me, considering I complained that the Kawai soundtrack didn't have enough flair and personality to it when I reviewed Fate Stay Night a while back. So, that should say something here. It's almost like Kajura's music is starting to become more complacent. It's like it's found its style and is unwilling to experiment beyond it, which is why I feel like this soundtrack is almost identical in tone to other things she's done recently, like Sword Art Online and even going back so far as Garden of Sinners. They just feel identical in tone, but hey, I'm not a music major, so maybe I'm just finding fault here where there isn't any. That is totally possible. Now, for the dub versus sub debate, I am rather torn. Like, on the one hand, I feel like the voices in the dub just fit the characters better. A lot of the characters are not Japanese, so it makes sense that most of them speak English, at least to an extent. On the other hand, with Saber receiving her third English voice actress following the original Fate Stay Night dub and the dub for the Unlimited Blade Works film, I still feel like the Japanese Saber is better. Maybe it's the more formal nature of Japanese culture that just comes out in her voice, which just gels with the character better for some other such reason, but I just prefer it. Now, that is not to say that Kari Walgren did a bad job. Oh no, hell no. I don't think there is a single disappointing matchup in the entire cast, except for maybe the children characters, but those are just hard to nail right anyway, so that's hardly a mark against it. So really, it just comes down to your own personal taste, as I can't recommend one over the other. Part of me is surprised that I'm not standing here. Satisfied, but not overcome with immense amounts of joy or excitement that the original hype of the series made me feel initially. I don't feel like this anime is the second coming of Christ or anything. Though if they kept going with the whole Grail Wars thing and summoning historic figures, I wouldn't be surprised if eventually they summoned Jesus himself. That might actually be pretty cool. If, you know, you could get him to do anything other than just turn the other cheek, but hey. Now, having said all that, I do find it hard to come up with any major complaints against it. Like, it's not perfect by any means. It heavily front loads the setting, it meanders quite a bit in the middle, and it all leads up to a finale that you probably could have predicted if you know 
anything about the story of Fates Day Night. This of course leaves any semblance of anticipation over what's gonna happen greatly diminished. Because you know how it's gonna end. You already know if some of these characters survive the war. They're in Fates Day Night. And even so, it is still with absolutely everything I've said. Probably one of the best experiences I've had with anime in a long time. As such, I cannot in good conscience give this show anything less than a recommendation of Certified Frosty. A ranking for only the best of the best, or for shows too important to ignore. Fate Zero is a masterpiece of work, combining the animation production behind the equally masterful Garden of Sinners film series with the writing of Gen Urobuchi and the universe of Kinoko Nasu, whose name I probably mispronounced. If you haven't watched it for whatever reason, go ahead and fix that because it is truly worth your time. Speaking of time, at the time of this video, Fate Zero has been licensed and is available on both Blu-ray and DVD from Aniplex. Be forewarned though, the Blu-ray release is either expensive or grossly expensive depending on if you're getting the localized release or the imported version. As much as Fate Zero is extremely beautiful and could only benefit from being watched on Blu-ray, it's up to your own discretion if you think $300 is worth it. You may also just decide to stream it legally on Crunchyroll. And if you so choose, that's an entirely free thing you can do. As doing that does not require to be part of Crunchyroll's premium service. Though if you did go to crunchyroll.com slash glass reflection, you could sign up for a free trial of it. Shameless plug. For alternate anime recommendations, there is Future Diary. If you desire another version of an equally dark kind of battle royale anime, and one that is far more suited to being called a battle royale, I might add. I would also, of course, recommend The Garden of Sinners, a film series that is one of my favorite pieces of anime and contains the same amount of visual quality that Fate Zero does. You should watch it as soon as you can if you have not already done so, and between both of those, I hope that you find something to your liking. And that's it from me. Please subscribe if you enjoyed the video, follow me on Twitter if you feel so inclined, and hey, if you like what I do here and feel like helping out, please consider going and checking out my Patreon page, and if you feel it within your heart, also consider donating. A very special thanks to everyone who donated ever by this point. I would be giving out a very specific shout out, but I have run out of them for the month of November because I did this whole review week of awesome thing and I gave you all individual shout outs because you were all individually amazing. So this is just one big giant thank you because you guys are amazing, seriously. And until next time, ladies, gentlemen, and others, stay frosty.